And it's time for this month's edition of Nerdline News. It's a short one, as not a lot has happened. At first, lockdown was very useful for writing up results and publishing papers, but for many groups, the pipeline is running a bit dry. That is not to say that no new stuff has come out, but it is all a bit specialist for the purposes of this show. But at least we have the Nobel Prizes. This year, the prize for physics went to Roger Penrose for his 1965 paper, where he took general relativity theory to one of its logical conclusions to predict the existence of black holes and demonstrated that they were an essential part of the theory of general relativity. You will, of course, remember that an image came out in 2019. The data used to generate this image is clear and unambiguous evidence for the existence of black holes according to Penrose's predictions, and that means that Roger Penrose finally qualifies for a Nobel Prize. The other half of the Nobel Prize for Physics goes to Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Getz for their discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. What is really cool is that Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Getz both led their own teams to look at the center of our galaxy and arrived at the same conclusions independently. They looked at the orbits of the brighter stars and found that the orbits can only be explained if there is a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. In the process, they had both developed new techniques and technologies to compensate for distortions caused by the Earth's atmosphere. The Nobel Prize for Chemistry went to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer A. Dudner for their genome editing method known as CRISPR-Cas9. Charpentier discovered a weird molecule now known as tracer RNA. She found it in the Streptococcus pyogenes bacterium, and she figured out that it is part of the bacterium's defense against viruses. When a virus attacks a bacterium, it injects its genetic code into the bacteria to encourage it to reproduce it and make lots more viruses. The tracer RNA molecule simply chops that DNA up into little bits and renders it useless. This discovery was published in 2011 and shortly followed up by setting up a collaboration with Jennifer Dibner's team. Together, they broke down the tracer RNA molecule to make a simpler version, which can easily be programmed, so the molecule cuts DNA at very well-defined and predetermined sites. Since its discovery, a whole new world has opened up for genetics research. The technology has enabled the production of more resilient crops, the possibilities of new cancer treatments, and highly personalized medicine. As is normal with gene editing technologies, there are many ethical issues, but the technology enables us to get a much better understanding of genetics and as such actually create a more informed discussion around the ethics of the subject. Finally, I should mention the Nobel Prize for medicine being awarded to Harvey J. Alter, Michael Hofton, and Charles M. Rice for their discovery of hepatitis C. The discovery enabled highly sensitive tests to be developed and almost eliminated transmission through blood transfusions, which was a huge problem. We now also have effective antiviral treatments which can cure the disease, and there is a real chance that we will be able to eliminate it. But that was it for the Nobel Prizes. Of course, there were others, but they are not sciencey enough, and it's time to move on to some far more important topics and far greater achievements. Last year, I covered a story about researchers crafting a knife from frozen shit and used it to try to cut animal hide. This story comes up again as the researchers have just won the Ig Nobel Prize for Material Science. Just like all the other winners, they received a paper cube and a trillion dollars. Zimbabwean dollars. The Ig Nobel Prizes are awards for scientists who do research that on the surface appears to be frivolous and silly, but when you look past that, the research actually represents a serious contribution to our understanding of the universe. Although the ceremony was digital this year, it is usually held at Harvard University just before the Nobel Prizes, and it usually is a Nobel laureate who presents the prize. One notable Ig Nobel laureate, of course, is Andre Geim, who won it for levitating a frog in an MRI machine. And one of Andre's less notable achievements include winning the Nobel Prize for discovering a method for fabricating graphene. Now, I won't go into the details of every prize, but there's a link in the description where all the prizes are listed, along with references. 
The Acoustics Prize went to a collaboration headed up by Stefan Reber for investigating alligator bellows and their role in communicating body size for courtship and territorial claims. They got the alligator to inhale helium to see what happens. The Psychology Prize was awarded to Miranda Jackelman and Nicholas Rule for a paper showing that eyebrows can be used to identify whether someone is a grandiose narcissist. The Physics Prize was awarded to Ivan Maximov and Andrei Pototsky for making living earthworms vibrate at high frequencies. This produced Faraday-like standing waves in the earthworm. Basically, they made an earthworm wiggle. But this is a fine example of the mission statement of the Ig Nobel Prizes. Their research may seem frivolous, but may actually be crucial in developing an understanding of how nerve impulses travel through the body. The Medicine Prize was awarded to Nienke Vullink, Damian Dennis and Arnaud von Loon for diagnosing a long unrecognized medical condition known as misophonia. It is a serious, life-altering condition in which people experience distress when hearing the sound of other people chewing. They demonstrate that the condition can be treated with cognitive behavioral therapy. So there is hope. The Entomology Prize went to Richard Vetter for showing that a large number of entomologists are afraid of spiders in his paper Arachnophobic Entomologists When Two Legs Make a Big Difference. It's just too good. The Economics Prize went to Chris Watkins for demonstrating that there is a link between income inequality and how often people kiss. But of course, where would the Ig Nobel Prizes be if they didn't take the piss? And oh lord, I am just about to butcher the pronunciation of some names. The Ig Nobel Prize for Management went to a group of assassins or hitmen uh, in Jiangxi in China. Uh, Zhi Guang accepted a payment to commit a murder, but subcontracted it to Mo Chang Zhang, who subsequently subcontracted it to Zhang Kang Sheng, who subcontracted to Zhang Guang Sheng, who subcontracted it to Ling Zhan Shi. As each person took a cut, the payment got increasingly smaller. No one actually committed the murder they were hired for, and this demonstrates the problem with excessive subcontracting in business. No one makes any serious money, and nothing gets done. The Peace Prize went to the governments of India and Pakistan for a rather strange manifestation of the tension between the nations. One of the ways that they have been battling it out is by getting diplomats of one country to ring the doorbell of a diplomat from the other country in the middle of the night and then running away. And this tit-for-tat exchange resulted in the Ig Nobel Prize. But finally, the creme de la creme of this year's Ig Nobel Prize, the Medical Education Award, which was awarded to Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, Jair Bolsonaro, Narendra Modi, Alexander Lukashenko, and several other nutters. They were awarded this prestigious prize because of their knuckle-dragging incompetence and outright sociopathic response to the coronavirus pandemic. And it demonstrated that politicians have a far greater and more immediate effect on life and death than actual doctors and scientists. But that was it for the prizes, and it's time to move on to some science stories. Researchers at the University of Hertfordshire in the UK did a thing. They calculated the stellar origins of all naturally occurring elements from carbon to uranium from first principles, and they visualized this in their version of the periodic table. The shading of each element indicates the source of the element, so we have almost all hydrogen coming from Big Bang nuclear synthesis, along with helium and lithium with small contribution from dying low-mass stars and exploding low-mass stars. Beryllium and boron come from heavier atoms decaying either through radioactive decay or being smashed to bits by cosmic rays. Then we get carbon and the heavier elements being formed by stars which die and explode. But then we get to another process, which is neutron star mergers. These events were hypothetical for a long time, but some of you may recall that LIGO detected a neutron star merger back in 2017, which was simultaneously observed using traditional astronomy methods. All the calculations in this paper are consistent with observations for all the elements, apart from one, and that's gold. 
The leading theory has been that most of the gold in the universe comes from neutron star mergers, but this paper casts some doubts on that. It looks like there is just too much gold in the universe to be explained by neutron star mergers. It is now up to the physicists to come up with experiments to try and explain this. However, it should be stressed that the authors of this paper do highlight a very simple explanation, and that is just that neutron star mergers are just far more common than we think. Now next we move on to CERN and the release of the first sustainability report of the Large Hadron Collider. The report is published among increasing concerns regarding environmental impact in the physics community with activists like myself pushing for greater accountability among physicists. CERN's report shows that the LHC emits 224,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gases per year. And in response, CERN is planning to increase its carbon dioxide output a bit more. Okay, I'm being a bit silly. During the planning and construction of the LHC, the big concern was CFCs and their impact on the ozone layer. Because of this, CERN opted to use fluorinated gases for their cooling systems instead. At the time, they were not aware that those fluorinated gases are outright awful, with a carbon dioxide equivalence of 23,000 in terms of global warming potential. The Large Hadron Collider is currently down for maintenance, upgrades and adjustments. Among fixing leaks and other stuff, the crew is looking to install systems to replace the fluorinated gases with straightforward carbon dioxide. This will increase the carbon dioxide output of CERN, but it will be offset by a large reduction in output from fluorinated gases, and it is a major component of the plan to decrease the carbon dioxide equivalent output by 28% in the next four years. Positron emission tomography is a useful tool in the diagnosis of cancer. The process takes advantage of beta plus decay, where a proton decays into a neutron and a positron. And don't forget that little electron neutrino. The positron can then annihilate with nearby electrons, which result in two 511 kilo electron volt photons going in opposite directions, most of the time. Sometimes the positron can get close to an electron and the two start orbiting each other to form something called positronium. The simplest form of positronium is parapositronium, where the electron and the positron have opposite spins and they orbit each other, but the orbit decays rapidly and the two annihilate to emit two 511 kilo electron volt photons. On average, this takes about 125 picoseconds. Now, in a PET scanner, these events are not distinguishable from straight-up annihilations. However, there is also orthopositronium, where the electron and the positron have parallel spins, and these last much longer. I mean, still only an average of 142 picoseconds, but for this purpose, that is a big difference. When these systems decay, three photons with energy between 0 and 511 keV are emitted, and these are detectable using PET. But due to orthopositronium's longer lifetime, it is more likely to interact with its surroundings, and it can exchange spin with other stuff to convert to parapositronium. And this is particularly likely to happen with oxygen molecules being present. With these principles, it is possible to measure the oxygen content in a tumor using a PET scanner as the fraction of the case from orthopositronium should decrease with increasing oxygen levels. And this gives us important information about the tumor as considerations of oxygen saturation are an important part in planning radiation therapy as tumors with high oxygen saturations require a much lower radiation dose. There are still many challenges in implementing this in diagnostics. One of the challenges is that the parent nucleus, which decays via beta plus decay, must also emit a gamma ray photon, which can be detected to count the number of decays that have occurred, and the fraction of orthopositronium decays can be calculated. The challenge now is to develop a pharmaceutical agent that can deliver a radionuclide that meets those criteria whilst not having a long biological half-life. In the corner of the internet that my channel sits in, the final story should be pretty obvious. A team at Cambridge University investigated people's susceptibility to misinformation and have identified a series of factors that make a person susceptible to believing and spreading misinformation. The team specifically looked at misinformation about coronavirus and 5G-related coronavirus conspiracies. To the researcher's surprise, 
but not mine, the biggest predictor for a person's susceptibility to these conspiracy theories is numerical literacy. The group took participants from the UK, US, Spain, Mexico, and Ireland to ask them questions around 5G and COVID-19, and also a series of control questions. They took this information along with demographic data and a numeracy test. What is surprising to me, however, is that education level only had a small effect on the susceptibility, and it actually went in direction of increased susceptibility. But that result is only significant when pooling all the data. The result disappears if you look at it by country. They found that in addition to numeracy, two big predictors for this bullshit receptivity are the individual self-perceived minority status and the amount of their information that comes from social media. Interestingly, trust in political leadership regarding the COVID-19 approach makes people more susceptible to spread misinformation, but only in Mexico and the United States. General trust in politicians did not show a significant result across the board, with a slight increase in susceptibility in the US, but nothing to write home about. Overall, Older people are less likely to spread misinformation about the coronavirus, and so are women in Spain and the US. There is no difference between the sexes in the UK, Ireland, and Mexico. It also seems that politically conservative people are more susceptible to misinformation regarding COVID-19. However, the result is not significant in the US or the UK. Now, I can think of a few serious limitations of this study, but the results aren't really that surprising. And finally, when controlling for the same demographic data as the first set of questions, it also becomes very clear that those who were considered susceptible to misinformation are also far more likely to reject a COVID-19 vaccine when it comes out. Again, not too surprising, but worth mentioning. So, that was it for this installment of Nerdline News. Uh, A few more headlines worth mentioning are... Uh, that we have discovered more liquid water lakes below the surface of Mars. Unfortunately, the lakes are extremely salty, which casts doubt on the probability of these lakes containing microbial life. We can add September 2020 to the list of temperature records set this year, with the month being half a degree hotter than September 2019, which already smashed previous records. During a bout of lockdown boredom, someone in South Wales decided to do a bit of a clear out and found a first edition copy of Newton's Principia and it has been sold at auction for £22,000. Sticking with auctions, a near complete T Rex skeleton named Stan has been sold to an anonymous bidder at auction for nearly US$32 million US dollars in New York. I am not sure that this kind of thing should be sold to private owners, but then again, that would make for some bitch and lawn art. Now, thank you all for watching, and a huge thanks to my patrons who are a massive help in keeping this channel running. Until next time.